Okay, so next up is uh, Lisa Brook, uh, Program Director in uh, Division of Genomic Sciences, to take you through the uh, Genomic Innovator Award concept. Okay, so the, this is, we're going to be talking about a potential new program here, and the motivation is, as you all know, that genomics is a very interdisciplinary field. There's a lot of consortia, large research groups, and a lot of really good people are in those groups, but they're not necessarily first author or last author, because there's a lot of people uh, in the two to the 99 numbers. Um, and yet, on the other hand, academic career advancement is frequently based on individual achievements. Um, in addition, the 21st Century Cures Act encourages NIH to provide programs um, to invest in the next generation of researchers and to promote opportunities for new researchers and earlier research independence. So um, I will say some of you might remember we discussed this three years ago, and the concept I'm presenting here incorporates the advice that you provided last time. So the aims of this program are to support highly innovative work in genomics, um, to support creative investigators to participate in consortia or similar large research groups um, who are early in their careers and who've shown the potential to make substantial contributions to the field of genomics. Um, the idea is to help such people become independent investigators so that they're not starting off as established investigators, um, but it's a way to help them get recognition and to develop their careers. So there's two points of focus here. One is on the career growth. Um, applicants should not, so this is like early stage investigators, applicants should not have an R01 level award already. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is that, uh, unlike some other programs like this, they will be eligible to get other research grants either from NHGRI or from other institutes or agencies. So the focus is really on the investigator. This is a people, not projects type of um, program we're talking about here. So that means that applications will include some aims. They do have to describe what part of science they're interested in doing, but it won't be the very detailed aims of like a regular R01. Um, so the applicants will need to demonstrate their contributions to team science to their consortia or to their large research groups. Um, and frequently, people in those consortia know who these people are. Um, so even though they may not be the uh, major author on papers, uh, people, the leaders of those groups or other researchers will know who they are and will be able to write recommendations. So the idea is that even if they can't show first or last author publications, that other people will be able to vouch for them. So. Um, the idea is that they'll have um, a track record and the promise for advancing genomics, and recommendations will help a lot to, to make that clear. Um, there are at least seven other institutes that have these um, people, not projects type of programs. These um, range a lot. Some of them are, are older, like the um, Director's Innovator Awards, where there's a focus, again, on creativity for all of these. Okay, thanks. Uh, so creativity is important for all of these, but some of these aim at early stage investigators, some of them aimed at senior investigators. Um, so there's various types of programs here. As Eric was saying, there's various sorts of experiments going on. Uh, so the idea with the review is that there would be one receipt date per year, um, that it would be an NHGRI review group um, that would evaluate applicants head to head. Evaluations would be based on two things. One would be the proposed work, the merit, innovation, and potentials for substantial contribution to genomics research, and then the other, of course, is the applicant themselves, um, that the promise and track record of creativity, productivity, and impact. So the idea of the funding is that it would be up to 300,000 direct costs, which is roughly 500K total costs per year two awards per year, um, each award for five years. So this would ramp up to supporting 10 people a year for about um, $5 million a year. Uh, so that's the outline of the program. Um, we have some people that want to um, start to discuss it, like Carol. 
So, um, yeah, I'll just say a couple things. So, a lot of so one of the things that I, I was originally really really supportive of this, but now I'm I'm sort I've sort of stepped back and said so in when you have these large consortia with many many um, people on the on the author list, some of those folks have as an aspiration to go on to an independent research career. Many of those folks want to go on to senior staff scientist careers that aren't your traditional lab heads but they still want to have um, some flexibility to do their own creative work, but they themselves might not be what we would consider a traditional PI. And I think that this funding mechanism was really aimed at the people who want to go on to more traditional track records and be heads of academic labs. So in that case, my, my question is, are there real, we all have anecdotal data probably, but are there real solid data that show that this is a real problem in genomics, that people in those, that have been part of those big projects, uh, what fraction of them that want to go on to independent careers actually can't because of uh, not being senior or first author? Is, is it really a, a big problem? Or would we do better to actually have a mechanism that funds kind of those senior staff scientists that are often doing a lot of the innovation uh, driving these big collaborative projects but don't themselves necessarily want to go on to a full independent career but yet bring innovation and, and intellectual value to these large projects. So um, I, I guess I'm sort of stepping back and saying um, is it as big a problem as we thought it was a couple of years ago? Do we have the data to support that? Or could we actually get a bigger value for the same amount of money by funding a different population of people that fall into this mix? Jay? Oh, sorry. Trey? Okay, thanks, Rudy. And then Jay. Um, yeah, so first of all, I fully support the idea of, of trying to re-enfranchise junior investigators. And I think like we were hearing um, maybe in some of Carol's remarks and also this morning a bit in the discussion was, was what's a little bit off-putting about this, as for lack of a better word, is, is, is the you must be member of a certain club. Um, even if we, we understand the intent, um, I, I get worried about the junior investigators who are part of that club, actually, and how we can enfranchise them because, in fact, it's really easy to get lost and, and miss the boat if, in fact, there's a boat that's, that's, you know, that's launched um, and, and jumpstart your career outside of those consortia. And that's, that's also a worry, I would argue, uh, for which we have no data. <laughs> So, so you know, I, I I wonder if we can soften that that requirement, which would then put me in full support of of this of this thing. You know, it, sort of the difference between when you I've been planning a new course, so courses are on my mind. Um, you know, the difference between making uh, you know linear algebra a course requirement versus a recommendation or something. You could certainly craft language that makes it clear this is is meant for a certain purpose to, to encourage um, scientists in the middle of, of these large papers without actually making it a requirement would be one, one thought. But, but that's just trying to solve a problem that I think is there, which is, you know, I really do worry that, um, that uh, we're creating clubs inside of clubs, and, and that's, that's the wrong direction. Okay, I've got Jay, I've got Val, I've got Aviv on the phone, and Raphael and Brent. So, so just I'll, I'll just start by saying I'm super positive about the program. I think it, I think the the direction that you're headed in was like you said with council input from a few years ago. Um, and on this this last point that Trey was making, I think Carol touched on too. I think my head has gone back and forth a little bit, but I'll just try to make the counter argument um, for why it should be a little more, or in support of it being a little more focused on a particular subset or club or whatever you want to call it. Um, and you know there are there are mechanisms for junior people, right? So there are, you know, they get a bump on their pay line. We've got we've got the new innovators program, right? There, there's a there's a, a set of mechanisms, and I think the intention here was not to replicate those other mechanisms, um, but rather to try something different, right? And and 
um, you know, I've, I've certainly sat on study sections and reviewed um, job applications in the context of faculty searches where I do think that even people who are at the very front of consortia papers are uh, disadvantaged relative to um, people who have, who have not been part of those things. And they're often terrific people, um, but it's just hard to disentangle contributions and that kind of thing, and it, it does put them at a disadvantage. Um, and I, I would hope that the intention here is not to create a program that allows them to contribute more to the consortium, but tries to, you know, help them break out a little bit and, and, and do something on their own uh, uh, and that kind of thing. So, I, you know, I, I, again, it's anecdotal. There's no data. But, I, I, you know, my sense is that there is a need here. And I think, you know, one way of thinking about this would be to try and keep it a little bit open at the beginning, um, you know, not too restrictive and just see what comes in. And then shape it a little bit more as the as the years go by, uh, to to depending on on what kinds of applications you get. That's just a thought. Yeah. So I've read this several times, and each time I read it, I like it better. Uh, so I wanted to sp I want to speak out in favor of it. Uh, I understood Trey and Carol's points, and I agree with uh, Jay's points as well. Uh, but it has certain words in here that uh, actually do make it quite broad. Uh, like I said before, uh, research consortia or similar groups. So I think that's broad, and I think leaving broadness in there would do what Jay uh, said, at least initially, being able to do the experiment and see what comes in. So I actually like that. There's there's other words in here that I think are are interesting and and I started thinking who who are you gonna who's gonna apply for these things uh, are they gonna be faculty member junior faculty member that are buried in, within a consortium or are they gonna be also uh, senior postdocs who have contributed uh, quite a bit and and who should it be. And in thinking about that, there's a phrase in here, there needs to be shown commitment uh, of the institution. And so I think in that sense, commitment by the institution for me would be they've already hired the person as a faculty member. It's, and so it's not going to be a competition among uh, postdocs, which I don't think it should be. Uh, uh, <coughs> uh, and, and there's also uh, some refining st uh, statements in here that I think keep it broad. For example, uh, uh, it says the in it's intended to support highly innovative works on problems in genomic by creative investigators. I think really the refining uh, word there is, uh, is uh, genomics important questions in genomics. And I think because of that, it could, uh, people could apply from research groups that aren't uh, necessarily uh, genomics research groups. They could be research groups that were working on a disease or something, but then they've got very good genomics people that get buried in there. And I think it would bring those type of people out. Uh, <clears throat> I did have another idea or two, but uh, uh, I like the size. Uh, I think this uh, ramping up to, to a steady state of potentially of, of 10 is, is enough to really have an impact. I also like the concept of uh, <clears throat> that it's an opportunity for NHGRI to open itself up to having more R01s, which has been a somewhat of a criticism in the past. So I think it's a good experiment uh, in that sense. And then one final thing on uh, page two of the concept. There's, there's a paragraph of relationship to ongoing activities, and it lists five different things that NHGRI supposedly does 
to support early stage investigators. And I throw that out as a reminder to NHGRI to continue to do those things, or if you're gonna have them in there, make sure you have the data to support that you do them. Okay, Steve, I've got Aviv, Raphael, Brent, now Steve, and Mark. Okay, Aviv, go ahead. Uh, I wanted to uh, echo and emphasize the point that Carol made about staff scientists. I think they're an important constituency, especially in genomics. There's a lot of genomics research that actually relies on staff scientists. And that does relate to the points that were made about um, that were made about the institutional commitment. Those people will have, you know, will have to have principal investigator status and committed institution. But it is important that the RSA or that the general documents in the end do not sound as though this is that you know a faculty position is the only legitimate um, legitimate path for this. Because I think most of the people who actually are more likely to be quote unquote buried in those author lists without any other paper that compensates for that as a first author or a more prominent position are actually staff scientists. And a lot of them carry, you know, genomics research um, endeavors that we all rely on for decades or more, and yet they never have, you know, independent funding to really support their own independent research program, and that's a PT. And that would actually work well also with this level of funding source. So, so I think while it's important to support the, um, early career scientists that are starting in faculty positions, there are more, there's much more flexibility of opportunity there, and it's important that the staff scientists will get um, an opportunity through this as well. So I, I like the first bullet point. It's great to support highly noted work in genomics. Um, and the last one, and I like the second one except for the first bullet. Um, so I guess what I would suggest is that to achieve the first one is that you you fund whoever you think would, would achieve that aim and can't use the current mechanism. Because as, as Jay pointed out, there's already current mechanisms. If you are creative and you can write an R1 or whatever it is, then that's, you use that. But if there's for some reason that doesn't work for you, and one of them could be because you're a staff scientist in a, in a consortia, then you apply for this. But I would not be restrictive at all in, in terms of the groups or, or, or clubs or whatever it was called earlier. So make sure I understand, you don't like the requirement to be in a consortium. That's what you're, or any large groups. It should be just wide yeah, so, so I would switch that to the, the, that you, it's for people who can't use the current mechanism. Okay. That would be my suggestion. To this point, Jay? So t to that point, I mean, I like that idea. And just to shape that a little more, uh, I mean, you could, you could imagine just ima have, having some substantial section, a half page or something like that, where they had to justify why they were systematically, ex you know, it's not that they're not eligible necessarily, because you obviously have to have eligibility to apply for a grant, but um, wh why more conventional or other mechanisms for new investigators would not work for them? or they would be disadvantaged. I'll say there's two aspects to this. One, as discussed here, is the consortium or group membership. The other is having minimal set of aims. So um, that hasn't really been discussed, but it's sort of it's a people, not projects. You know, some of what's been discussed, it could be open up to anybody who can't apply for like a regular R01 in some sense. But do you care about the specificity of the aims, or do you want just an R01 that's available a little more broadly than regular R01s? I think I speak for a lot of people. I, I think we all were very excited about the people not aims idea. <laughs> people not aims. But at the same time, you got to you got to say something, right? You got to you got to have a. It, it, it's got to be. <laughs> I mean, like every every yeah. Okay, yeah, so I'd just like to echo a lot of what's been said. I mean, so as somebody who's been in consortia and been in the past and currently trying to recruit people like this, 
I think there is a need for supporting people in those because not everybody in those consortia rises above to the superstar. Those people are easy to recruit. It's the, the sort of second batch. That being said, I do worry about the club of the clubs. Um, I think that's an, a bad issue to um, put forward as a requirement. Um, so I'd say these people could be part of consortia, but it's not, I would say it shouldn't yes. be a requirement. I would rather support genomic innovators regardless of their background. And I, the thing I like about this, which distinguishes it from a regular R1, is it's the person, not the project. And if everyone's just competing for R1s, I mean, there's no set number of R1s that are funded, but you're then competing with everybody else at the same time, whereas this is sort of set aside funds for new junior investigators. To that point again, Jay? Uh, maybe a little bit to that point. I think, I think, I mean, just two points. One, one is that I, I think it's important that either in the letters or in some other way that it be made very clear that whatever funds are being committed are truly for this person to do whatever the heck they want to do and aren't going to get sucked up by virtue of their being a staff scientist in a mega lab or, you know, part of one of these consortium that is going to kind of usurp that money, right? So I think that's, that's one reason why it would be important to have some aims laid out so you can actually say that these are for doing something distinct from what your broader lab or your consortium is focused on. Um, and I guess to that, maybe on a similar point, you could, you, uh, one can make an argument. I think the levels at which you're funding are fine, but I could also imagine an argument for saying these people are also part of other things, whether they're consortia or other projects. And so you could imagine funding, you know, 200 or 250 and, and being able to use the money to, to fund more people, right, if this is an experiment. All right, to that point, Mark, so to, to, to Brent's point, uh, <laughs> if, if you open it up to everybody, then the first authors on those papers are going to look the best to the study section, and they're going to get the funding. So you're going to not serve these people if that's the goal. I think it. I, I do want to. I, I want to speak to what Mark just said because that was my concern. Part of the part of what the last time we discussed this at council, and with some of the subsequent follow-up discussions, been among staff was this idea: Could we use this as an opportunity to reward? the team science-oriented scientist who doesn't come in and compete with first author publication and so forth. And if we open it totally wide up, are we afraid that, you know, I'm sure we'll get fantastic people, but we won't have quite done the unique uh, maneuver of trying to enrich for people that otherwise would, when they go head to head, are not the ones getting the grants, maybe not the ones getting the faculty position. So that, that was the attempt. I also would point out, that it's only two of these a year, even at a total, you know, we're not going to we're not going to totally move the earth on this. We're too small of an instant. And so the idea was, again, from the last <laughs> discussion, was is there a, a niche that we could make a unique contribution compared to other efforts going on at NIH? And one idea was the team science oriented investigator that otherwise already gets lost in the crowd. But is there any language in here that would prevent those first authors of consortium papers from applying from yeah, this? Well, yeah. I mean, because I don't actually think they can't uh, have gotten another R01. But I don't. I don't know if you necessarily. I mean, I would take the first author over the middle up there for a, for if they're if you know if they're a better person, right? Like that, that shouldn't be a disqualifier. But. I've got uh, Steve. Then did you give up your slot, Mark? Another point. Steve, Mark, Jeff, Jonathan. Anybody else in the queue? Steve. Go so ahead. so when I first read this, I actually got quite confused on this point. Was um, I understand that you want to support people, not necessarily projects, um, but I, I sort of got confused. That <clears throat> it seemed awfully restrictive to a certain type of person. And in fact, when I read it, it seems to me that if you're um, at this stage of your career and if you read what's on that paper, you'd say, well, if I'm part of the consortium and I'm kind of buried deep, then that's the only person that can apply. And on the other hand, first of all, second of all, maybe, I, I want to say that I'm totally supportive of the program because I think it's a really, really good idea. Anytime you put sort of young people and you want, con you want good ideas and promising people together and you want to fund them, I mean, that's a really good thing. Um, but I am worried a little bit about the pigeonholing of the certain type of people that you want because good, innovative people come from all sorts of places. I understand the concept that, you know, maybe they're not the superstar and maybe they don't you know, verbalize all their ambitions and aren't and they're in center, in center stage. 
Um, but maybe the R01 takes care of that. I don't know. You know, if they don't have an R01, then, you know, it's a first grant mechanism no matter what. I can't really tell. But, but, but like I said, when I first read this, um, and it says, you know, as a member of a consortium, that sort of brings up a notion of a certain type of person in a very selected area. And I, and I think if the ambition is to really get good innovation and really good people, they come from lots of places. So I would just be careful not to restrict it too much right now. Mark, you're back up. I just want to reinforce something Jay said. I'm, I'm worried that uh, this will end up just adding to the consortium's effort. And it seems to me what you want to do is more like a K99, isn't it? Isn't it the K99 grant where you want to help them develop their own independent research program? Except it's different from a K99 that you're funding the person, not the project. Right? Jeff? So why, oh, why sorry, isn't it the K99? Sorry. This is not, this is an R01. This is not a K99. We do have yeah, K99. But those, so that, that has to be for, you have to be a postdoc <laughs> when you apply for that. And you have to end up in yeah, a faculty. This doesn't other. Go ahead, Aviv. I just want to point out this cannot be to the K99 because the K99 has a long training phase, and these are for people who presumably are at the end of and moving out of training or have not been trained for quite a while. So we do fund K99, oh, yeah. so that niche is filled. Right. And that, I think, very much works well with people who end up being the first authors of these lovely papers that we all have been talking about, right? Because of, it's natural. That would be very appealing to the reviewer of K99. Yeah, the K99 has specific requirements for a training plan, for a mentoring plan, for a career development plan. Right. Which is different. Yeah. Right, and and I think I think also thinking about the scale of the funding, with two, if these are just two R ones in the kind of standard, more most general pool in the pool of many other R ones, then even if we make them about the investigator and not about the research program, I think their impact is reduced. Whereas if we try and really use them to capture a distinct population and emphasize that this is about the research, the the person more than the uh, specific projects, then, then it is a real experiment in something new. And then, almost regardless of the outcome of the experiment, we learn something extraordinarily valuable from it, and presumably, still great, proposed, uh, great people will be funded through it. You done? Okay. Jeff, you're up. I'm certainly attracted to this notion of trying to give uh, people earlier in their careers a, a leg up here, but I guess I'm still struggling with what kind of person this is. And so um, you have people who have been unable to get RO ones. They've tried. And, and maybe that's because the study section is risk averse, and here we've got somebody with uh, some innovative ideas. You know, is that really, is that a, the type of person, I'm, I'm guessing that's not the type of person we're thinking about here, but I'd be interested in sort of some concrete confirmation that that's the case. And if it's folks who haven't applied yet and haven't really tried for an R01, but yet they want that independent career, um, I guess I'm wondering how many people will have substance, sufficient substance in their career to date to say we're going to invest this uh, amount of money for this amount of time uh, into this individual and allow them uh, some independence. And I guess as others have said, the independence seems to me to undermine the value of the consortium. Uh, by pulling out talented people and asking them to go ahead and pursue uh, uh, independent work, uh, and that uh, that may be uh, a, a destructive influence in that respect. So I guess maybe I just want some, some clarity. For folks who have tried to get RO1s but have not been successful, is that the type of person we're thinking about here, or are we really thinking about folks who haven't evolved to that point yet? Well, I'll turn it into a bit of a joke. as. One of the SROs who may be responsible for organizing this review, the notion of saying this is for everyone who hasn't been able to succeed on your own in R01, send us your ideas. No, we don't want that. Yeah. Okay, John, Jonathan was in the queue, so hold on, Trey. So as, as someone who has been a team scientist for 30 years, some odd, many, too many years. 
um, and someone who's advocated for team science and had to do that at multiple institutions to try to get them the recognition that they deserve. Um, I think focusing this on, a, on team science is a good idea. And I, I, I'm usually a pretty agreeable guy, but I think I'm disagreeing with some of the folks here. Um, I really think that having that focused in, in that way for the individuals, not who are the first authors, I mean individuals who, who are the contributors, who have an you know, haven't had an opportunity to, to rise for whatever reason. We know, this, we know what the dynamics of, in a lot of these consortia are like and how difficult it is to get the recognition that you deserve. So I think having this as a focused effort for that, I think is a really, really good idea. I think you, could, you, you can tweak a little bit how you define team science, you know, how you define that, I think, and maybe, it's, maybe you don't have to require the consortia idea, uh, although that's likely to be where most of these folks are coming from. But I think it's really important that, that we focus in that area. I, I, I see this sort of as, as, a, as a pilot idea. I mean, this may be a year or two or three from now, we can broaden it out to, to some other things. But right now, I think that's, that's a real problem area that we have a real opportunity to, 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 you know, to focus in on and help solve. And so I'd be all, all in favor of the, of the team science idea. Can I, can I just amplify one point, Jonathan? I really do want to stress that this is an experiment. You know, you heard from Lisa. There's other institutes doing other things. We're going to do this. It's going to be small scale compared to some of these others. Only two a year, and I, but it will be an experiment. And like any experiment, we don't have to force ourselves to stay that in a in a zone for five or even ten years. If I would very much, I would like to see you know us be in a position to reevaluate what's coming in and whether we're locked out two or three years in, and we'll, we could tweak it after that. We're not going to be locked into anything forever. And so I think some flex, we should just keep in mind, it'll be, it'll be an ongoing experiment and we will have future councils tweak it as necessary. So, so here's what is a little bit confusing about this idea. You have, for me, you have a staff scientist uh, that is part of a team that presumably has a lot of money because they're in one of these big teams. Now you're going to give one of their staff members 300,000 a year, what, what are they going to do now? Are they going to continue being a team scientist and just add this to the big pool of the team, or are they going to go and do their own thing? Uh, that's what I... I assume they would do both. I assume if this person is going to get an award, they're being quite successful within the consortium. We don't want to force them to leave the consortium. We're allowing them to do something where they're not restricted or bound to the consortium. This is Dan. Go ahead, Dan. And so, so as I listen to this, I, one way to think about this is, first of all, I'm not sure that any two would give a reasonable view of 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 where the potential is, but I recognize that we don't want to make n equals two. The, one way of thinking about this is, what happens to these people three or five years down the road? Is this is it that they will be competitive from our own ones. The expectation is that this is like a one. I'm concerned that this is like a one-time bowl into the mall large organization makes of a difference to the organization and won't, in fact, make much difference to the applicant. So so I would just encourage the, the RFA, as it's written, uh, to make clear to the sex and evaluate these polls exactly what the criteria are uh, and we're not just interested in somebody who happens to be particularly good in a team. They get a bunch of money, but they're not going to do anything different from what they would do in a team and what the long-term outcome of this might be. Okay, Dan. Uh, Aviv, hold on one second. Trey is next in line, then I'll come back yeah. to you. So, so yeah. I just want to make the, the sort of point here that I think you guys can achieve everything you want to achieve, and I think you're making very good points. But I think it can all be achieved without saying this person has to be part of ENCODE or fill in the blank of whatever formal collaboration <laughs> you're talking about. Um, they're just, right, so that, so that's that's the only point science. I want to... So if we change the wording, it should be a team science-oriented... I mean, is that the overarching uniqueness here? I, I think... I think Because we, we could simply say they have to have demonstrated an interest and motivation yeah, just, and blah, blah, blah. It's a team science. A thoughtful phrasing of that, I think, okay. is, is, so the, is the key. Because you have all sorts of people, and I, I think we all speak from our own experience. I mean, I'm... 
I like to think of us as extremely collaborative as a lab, and we're involved in a patchwork of things, but it's hard pressed for us, and I think a number of, of people in my circles to say, oh, I'm part of this or that. Or, I mean, you are and you're not at all, you know, and you publish some, some of the, you know, papers and some of the back-to-back -back journals, but I don't think we're on the, in, you know, we're not on the ENCODE grant. We're not on the TCGA grant, you know, even though we're, we're very much involved in some of the same activities. So I think if you just said collaborative science or team science, but, but, but I, I really that, want to make sure that I would take care of that. But do you yeah. like the idea that if I was asked what's unique about NHGRI's program in this fund, people not that, what I would like to be able to say is we are trying an experiment to enrich for team scientists as opposed to non-team scientists. So we, we, so we did that by saying you had to have been a consortium. Maybe you could say you have to have a very nice half page describing how you are. Because this is a unique, this is a different so, niche. So, so I, would, I would second what Raphael said. I think th rethinking exactly what that first bullet, the bullet point 2.1 yeah. says yeah. would be but, would, but is I the just key. Wanna, do you agree with the idea that the unique part of our unique contribution would be making it a team science oriented person? Or not, because I guess I can't still can't quite tell whether you want to have any restriction or whether you don't want to. Have I think there's been a lot of so so I I like the idea. I I'm not sure if I mean I think there's been a lot of debate yeah. about that around the table, and I'm not sure if we have consensus on that. Personally, I like the idea of okay. a collaborative focused okay R01 or win. Yeah. Okay, wait a second. Aviv wants to answer this question. That's her message. So go ahead, Aviv. <laughs> yeah. Well, th that was a question from uh, five minutes ago. There was a question of what would happen with those people once they got this funding, would, be, would we be depleting the, the original goal of team science and consortium effort? And so I wanted to point out that NCI set up a program which was specifically, I think, for staff scientists. It's an R50 grant. And it just supports the person's salary. And I think it was partly is an indication that these people are not entirely beholden to someone else who's the PI of the grant on which they were initially funded. But from my extremely non-representative sample of a few people I know who've received these, the outcome was actually remarkable because on the one hand, these people still continue to perform a lot of the functions that they did before, but they would often, for example, hire a person to work with them and have the opportunity to supervise someone or already were supervising people but expanding it. And the time that was released was really used in order to do new and exciting endeavors but often, and almost for, you know, for the scientific nature of things, these were things that were kind of pushing the envelope of the area in which these people were engaged before. So it had all of the desired effects. And that was actually in a smaller setup of funding because it was really just salary support for the investigator themselves. There wasn't really a grant involved. I like this program better than that program, but at least it's an indication that this idea does not undermine the team science uh, okay, I've got Dan on the phone. I've got Steve. I've got Jay. Anybody else want to get in the queue? John again. Dan, go ahead. Val. No, I already had. I already said what I needed to say five minutes ago. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Thanks. Yeah, the rewards of waiting. Steve, go next. Okay, so I think the first bullet is really good. <laughs> <laughs> support highly innovative work in genomics. I don't think anybody will argue with that. Yeah. The, the second part, though, I think there's, there's two pieces to this. One, that it, it certainly it should be an opportunity for people that participate in team science. I think the question you brought up is that sort of the unique differentiator. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's an experiment. It's possible. But I, it's also, I think the question is, do we really have data that it's really self-limiting and it's really a problem. The one area that I do know that is a problem is when someone writes for an R01 or something, you know, and they don't have any uh, preliminary research or they're not a well-known researcher, right? They pretty generally get two, right? And so I guess one of the questions, it could be you support creative investigators who, for example, participate in consortia or similar line groups or uh, you know, or it, it, I hate to say it so broadly, but are, um, you know, at a junior stage in their career. And because you really want, I would argue, you certainly want to, are you trying to solve this particular problem in consortia, or are you trying to find innovative people? And you can certainly encourage people that are in consortia to apply. You can also encourage people that for whatever reason 
are under the umbrella or shadow of something else. So anyway. Yeah, so I think, I think Aviv kind of made I think some of the points I was going to try to make more cogently than I would make them. But the, the, I mean, just to go back to your point, like how would you describe this uniquely, right? I, I don't think you describe it as we're trying to improve team science, right? Because that's not really what it's trying to do. It's trying to identify individuals who are, are in that matrix and give them some independence, right? That, that would be, and it's an NHGRI specific thing. And to Steve's point, I do think, you know, again, like there are other mechanisms for for, for supporting young people, again, right, or for, for supporting creative people. But, I, you know, just to come back to the point, what's NHGRI specific? Team science is certainly, you know, not somewhat NHGRI specific. Another thing is, you know, technology innovation, right? And I've certainly seen, you know, students of mine and others get disadvantaged applying to conventional mechanisms like the Innovator Award and things like that where the review comes back, you know, great project. I just don't really like technology, so sorry. You know, so so... Well. You know, but it, it, that, that kind of loops back to having a broader box where we just say, you know, why are you disadvantaged from other mechanisms and, and allowing people to, to come into that box, whether it's because of team science or some, something else that, um, yeah, but. So just to go, to go back a little bit, I think the, I mean, I, Again, I still like the idea of team science and focusing in on the team science. I think the, the idea here, at least in, in my mind, and, and certainly where I've had struggles with some of my junior faculty and some of my you know, former trainees and things like that, is being able to give them an opportunity to move beyond just the team science, beyond just being part of a consortium. That doesn't mean they're going to leave consortia. They're, they're there for a reason. They like that kind of, most of them like that kind of thing. And they want to do that. This just gives them an opportunity to move a little bit beyond that and also be in charge or, or you know, have a project, whatever that project is, because it's people, not projects, <laughs> um, and, and move there and become what our institution now calls a hybrid scientist, where they're PI on some things and, and team science on other things. And I suspect that there are, I mean, we're not talking a huge number of people here. I suspect there are a few that w where that would really, really fit very, very well, and they'd be tremendously valuable to the community. But they, you know, they just, they need that opportunity because they're never, in, under the current formats, they're very unlikely to be able to go off and get their own R01. So I, I you know, on, on a project basis. So I think this is really a, you know, I, I think there's a really good trajectory for the, for the people that would get funded. I've got Val, Gail, and Trey. Carol again. Okay, I'll try to make this short. First, I wanted to point out, I was very struck by uh, uh, Jonathan's telling of his own story. He's clearly very talented. In fact, I wanted to point out from your talk this morning uh, that he was instrumental in the AMD GWAS story which was the first GWAS. <clears throat> uh, uh, this, the other thing I wanted to point out, and I might get, uh, I like analogies, so I might get a little uh, silly here, but uh, uh, I think the issue is how deep these consortia are. So uh, is there talent buried in there that aren't brought out? So the analogy is the Boston Celtics, okay? <laughs> you injure Gordon Hayward, Kyrie Irving, you find Terry Rozier, Marcus Smart. So is that what we could bring out of this? And uh, that's my analogy. Uh, the question is, are these consortia deep? Gail, you're next. So um, as I've been listening to you all, I've been thinking about people I know in my research teams who I would never, ever be able to be successful without. They're my co-investigators. They have been, some of them, for a decade. Um, and they, I was thinking about what Carol said in the very beginning. And they are, they are happy functioning in that. They're, they do their best work 
in collaboration. They're, all of us who work with them think, man, these are really smart people. They're, they're very creative, but for perhaps a variety of reasons, are not interested in becoming established independent investigators, which is your very last bullet. And so I'm, I'm, as I've listened, this is a really interesting conversation, as I've listened to it all, I'm, I'm thinking there's almost this kind of uh, um, contradiction between finding people who, who are really talented partly because of the qualities I just described and then giving them five years of a fair amount of money per year that was direct. I mean, that's, 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 that's great. And then, it, what, and then what the product would be. And, and that's the thing I'm a little confused about at the end. And again, I think you said that at the very beginning. And I, would, I personally would really love if there was a mechanism that would be something that people in that position I just described would be competitive for. OK, I've got Trey, Carol, and then I want to take a straw poll. Good idea. So. Um, just a thought, you know where this idea might work really well, and, and not instead of this, this discussion, but if, if successful, maybe at a later date, would be, as, as all of us know, when these large consortium grants roll out, there's not one mechanism, but there's a whole constellation that come out. Why not include this as one of those? So next to the data coordinating center and the data generating center, you have for that specific mechanism, you could attach, and then you would, then it's very unabashed. It's for that particular consortium. We want to make sure that we don't bury people in it. It's just a, just a thought for later. Mm -hmm. Carol, last word. Well, my was, last word was that I feel like the discussion's been really good, but it suggests to me that we aren't ready to, uh, that there's not going to be unanimity on this concept at this point in time. I could have told you that a couple of days ago. <laughs> okay, the straw poll I'd like to run is just a quick show of hands. How many people are in favor of including the phrase team science as a requirement for entry in this FOA? Team or, co team or collaborative science? We're going to have to define collaborative. How many would uh, vote for that? One, two, three, four, five. And how many don't want, and who doesn't want to see that in this FOA? They just want it wide open. I want to know what science isn't collaborative. Carol, well, Carol we have a problem that, defining that, no. collaborative. That, that's certainly true. So do I have some abstainers here? Because I, okay. Uh, this is Dan, I'm a no. Hold on, Dan, hold on. Was the vote um, that team science, only those that are in team science can apply? Correct. Versus, broad, broad versus sense anybody else. Science. Correct. Those are your two choices. <laughs> yeah, but team science writ broad. Not NHGRI consortia. Yeah. Team science. I mean, anybody who has it. I thought that's what I was doing. And presumably they would have, and presumably they would have to just to write some short justification of why they are in team science. If they want to get through the peer review system, probably yes. Dan, did you want to make a comment? Uh, well, I, I, I agree with Ken, you know, most, most science, science, but I think confining this to something that is defined as Time is restrictive and it seems exclusionary, uh, as I think with Trey who said it about half an hour ago. Jeff? Yeah, I think uh, there's a compromise position. I think Jay identified it, I think it was Jay, uh, a while ago, which is you could include team science consortia, but any other rationale you might put forward for why it is you've been. Uh, uh, unable to succeed, uh, so, leave, so there's an emphasis perhaps on that, but not exclusive. Maybe that can be phrased so that you're not arguing why you're no good, but, <laughs> but, but yes, um, you are arguing why, you know, why should the study section believe you are a collaborative gal or guy? Why your brilliance has been overseen. 
My problem is, it seems to me, you're undermining team science. Because what you're saying is you want to support people who do team science, but you want to support the guys who want to get out of no, team I don't, science to I, do their own I don't think this has, as a, a successful endpoint, a removal from... Right. I think of it as freedom operate. You've now become, I mean, one of the things I thought of with this is that sometimes you're supported within a consortium or within some project, and you have some skills, analytical skills or experimental skills, technology skills, and you want to have the ability to jump around maybe and, and bring those skills to other projects, other programs, other consortium, other whatever. This would give you freedom to operate. This would be funding the person to basically control their own destiny. They're not going to have to worry about getting listed on a grant to get support for it. So my attitude is they could choose to remain team-oriented and go to different consortium on their choice, not others, or they could become what Jonathan, I like what Jonathan had to say, I like this hybrid idea. Uh, this is, when I had trainees, this is what I strongly encouraged when they got involved in the consortium, I would say, would well, also try to become a little bit of a hybrid because you want to be able to have some part of your program be independent and some part of your program. This, if they, were, if they aspire to that, they have, again, freedom to operate because they, they have their own grant, they have their own money, they have their own support. Someone that has worked in multidisciplinary groups that would like some independence to work with other multidisciplinary exactly. groups. Exactly. Okay. Well, well consortium. Well, we'll say so, something so I, like well, Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's I, great. But, but right away we yeah. go down this tube of ENCODE. And, no, and yeah, well, don't like go that. down. And that's not what you're saying. No. Okay. No, well, that's that's why, what the phraseology supports. Okay. Yeah. So okay. I think, again, I was trying to change okay. the phraseology to team yeah. science and it just maybe we should forget the consortium because maybe that brings up, conjures up names and clubs and all that. So. Yeah. But I, I like this idea of hybrid scientists, freedom to operate, interdisciplinary, that team science, that was what we were trying to get at. at least I was trying Carol, to get at. hold on one second. Carolyn. Okay. And I just wanted to, on that part, because it's something that hasn't come up in the discussion, is in the concept as we do it, we talk about an a idea of percent time for this person. So it does differ a bit from the NCI model, which is like, let's fully fund a, a staff scientist. And here we're seeing it as like a 50 to 30% time commitment yeah. is what we're imagining to give them, again, that space and that freedom to, to innovate and move, but then, you know, we're not giving them 100% of their funding, so to say that we're pulling them fully away from something, they still have to get funded for the rest of their So we'll be clear to make it that we're not going to kill the consortia. This is a better concept than the one that our VCs in NCI are based on. I only use that as an example, but even in that context, that was actually a little less than ideal in how it was framed. So I know about five or six people who received these, and I don't think in one case anyone would argue that this compromised the team science from which they grew. I think everyone would say only amplified and increased it while also giving them independence. I also think it is our responsibility to make sure that people who want to be independent in science don't end up being cornered into places where they cannot develop that independence while they're serving, you know, the greater cause. That would be unfair and also a great loss of talent. Carol. I just want to make sure that I understand the, the so I like this idea of hybrid and freedom to operate. Is this only for people who are on a track for like a tenure track faculty slot, or is this really open to the staff scientist person as well, who may or may not? I mean, this goes back to institutional commitment, because oftentimes institutional commitment to faculty is different than it is the staff scientist, and and I, I I'm still sort of unclear on that point, and I think it's a really important point for this particular mechanism. I, I don't think, but I don't think we were we were not going to limit it in terms of what the we, we want institutional support and peer review. We'll sort out what that means, but we're not. There's not going to be required to be a tenure track investor. It's not going to be required uh, to have any other. I mean, because institutions do different things than what they allow people to apply for. So we'll, we'll let the ecosystem go to whatever it does. Okay. So are you going to get a two second? Uh, drop on this. <laughs> so but I think we heard some valuable language. So I mean, I think we can commit to modifying the wording. I, I right. can see what we don't like. I heard. I think what people like, broadened a little, but still try to keep the spirit of what we were trying to do through some of the other words that I was using. Okay. Could we bring it back to the August meeting? Uh, a, re a revised language. We. We have time. I mean, I will tell you. Part of the reason we we wrote we brought we at least worked very hard for this. Once we got the bolus of money to get it to this council so that we could get it going to get it out next year. 
I'll so also. some of us are just anxious to start the experiment, to be honest with you. And we can do it. We have money set yeah. aside for next year. Use, I've put in, you know, sequestered a little bit of our increase this year to make sure it's available to start it next year. These things take a year. We still have to write the FOA, get it out, applied for, reviewed, and funded. I retract my comment. <laughs> and Carol, we only and have our, three our, hours Carol, on that Carol call. <laughs> so did we? Yeah, we're only talking about two hours. Right. Okay. We're talking about two. It'll come to next May Council so we can fund it by the end of fiscal 19. Yeah. Right. Okay. So we okay. take a vote. So I think we better take a vote. <laughs> So I'm looking for, I'm asking for uh, a motion to um, approve the concept and a second. All in favor? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you very much. Dan, I'm in favor. Thank you, Dan. You can, you can also vote by email. Um, oh, okay. As a courtesy to Dan, who's been here since 1 o'clock, I'd like to go. get his presentation yeah, yeah. launched, right, and then we'll take our break afterwards. Okay. By the way, I should point out that that was a terrifically valuable discussion and completely predicted by most of us. We knew that this was going to be an incredibly interesting discussion, and so it, nothing, none of it came as a surprise to the staff. What? You approved it. Yeah. We, we thought you'd approve. No, but we, we knew there was going to be this incredibly rich discussion because it really is lots of different ways to look at it. So we're not surprised by the richness of that discussion.